good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. Maybe this is your first time tuning in and joining us. We extend a warm welcome to you and trust you're blessed with what you hear today. We want to begin with prayer. We want to continue to pray for the nation of Israel um, and all that is happening there. We want to continue to pray for the safety of the city of Jerusalem. We also want to remember Sister Jamie Prado and Ayla and Nora. We also want to remember to pray for um, the Archdale family at this time. And we want to continue to pray for little Raphael Courtney that has been in a children's hospital in Seattle, Have it, has had some very grave complications, so we need to continue to pray for him. Maybe you have a special and spoken request. It's a perfect time to make that known unto God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you. We are overwhelmed with gratitude and awe about the invitation to be a part of this incredible kingdom. And God, we pray um, today specifically, we pray for everything that is taking place in the Holy Land. We pray for your hand to be at work for God's people and the city of Jerusalem. Father, we also pray for Sister Jamie Prado and Ayla and Nora. We pray for the Archdale family, for the everlasting arms to be wrapped around them in comfort and strength. And we also pray for little Raphael Courtney. God, we believe you for an absolute miracle to take place in this baby's life. God, in all of the other multiplicity of requests that are, that are out there represented in this devotional today, we pray that you'll meet each and every one of those needs. We ask this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said amen. Some days I wake up in the morning and I'm just like, it's just like a laser with my focus about thoughts that um, we want to bring forth for our devotional. Today is one of those kind of days where I need to do a little chewing, a little thinking, praying, meditating. And I really feel like I have just a couple little things to share about an incredible passage of Scripture that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Um, and let's read this and we'll talk about this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 um, uniquely is placed between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. I know that chronologically that doesn't, or numerically, that doesn't mean a whole lot, except that the content in 1 Corinthians 13 is incredibly important. Of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul um, is introducing the gifts of the Spirit. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about their placement relevance to the body, how that there needs to be a cooperative aspect. And then he qualifies these gifts and shows the importance that even though we have giftedness, that they need to operate by the agape, the love of God. And there's some other things there. And then he goes on talking about the importance and the superiority of prophecy and the vocal gifts. But I want to talk about one aspect that's here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 because it's coming directly from the Holy Ghost through the Apostle Paul. And look what he says here in verse number 11. 
When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, contextually, and this is not eisegesis, this is not what I think, this is exegesis. You are seeing, the Apostle Paul is using this as an illustration, a practical, a practical life illustration of the superiority of, in this particular setting here, of becoming a man. But he's also talking about the perfection that will come. And this, this is a big deal. And I don't really want to open a can of worms here. But I, I can't go where I want to go without at least addressing this. This particular passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is so critical interpretationally because there is a lot of Christendom, and I'm using that phrase very loosely here, Christendom, um, that has used some of the, the verbiage here, some of the wordage here, as being evidence that the, the gifts have ceased. In fact, they would posit that this whole, the whole purpose for this chapter is to show that when the canon, when the completion of the Word of God comes, that the gifts will no longer be needed. Of course, I want to tell you that that is absolute folly. It is incorrect. It is eisegesis, not exegesis. Um, and that, but that is not really what I want to talk about, um, even though that is a worthy study and would go far beyond one I mean, we could describe it in some very general terms and and probably should at some point because there are a lot of people out there that think that anybody that is speaking in tongues is, is just merely gibberish. And they all root it, when it comes all the way down, it's right here. Prophecies shall cease, speaking in tongues will cease. Well, that is not talking about the completion of canon. That is talking about... But when that which is perfect has come, that is not talking about the completion of canon. That's talking about seeing Jesus Christ face to face, the second coming, or being in the presence of God. Gifts will no longer be necessary, obviously. Um, but that is a major, major deal. But I want to talk about this illustration that the apostle uses to underscore when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And he's using this illustration to explain that, okay? When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. This usage of this is a powerful illustration to reveal that as we come into spiritual maturity and we come into more spiritual knowledge, understanding, wisdom, that there is a, I, I hate to use the word automatic, but there is a there are a series of choices. There is a comprehension. There is a mentality. There is a choosing to let certain things go because we have now arrived at maturity. And I've already mentioned where this is placed and why it's placed. It is addressing and underscoring 
Another context that the Apostle Paul is talking about, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And he's talking about spiritual gifts. We see, see through a glass darkly. We, the, the spiritual gifts are given to the body, and the body of Christ is still in the earth. So the gifts are still there. But this illustration, in my opinion, goes beyond just this context. It is so useful because it reveals the difference between spiritual immaturity and spiritual maturity. One of the scriptures that comes to mind is in the book of Hebrews chapter number five, um, where the apostle is instructed. He's making the statement that you should be teachers at a time when you should be teaching other people about what you know. You're still needing to be instructed with um, with milk. And he is using the analogy there, the comparison there between between milk and and you're needing to hear these things again when you should be offering and your diet should be on strong meat. It's all there. It's in Hebrews chapter 5, and it moves into Hebrews chapter 6, which is important stuff, very important illustration. But it comes to mind with this. I am seeing some things in, in the body, in the church I pastor, and really in the church as a whole that I think I think could benefit from this passage of scripture. There if 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 in a perfect scenario where I come in to the church I as a first generation apostolic or you've been sitting on a pew and and your parents are sitting across the church, it makes no difference to me. When when you finally respond to the gospel and you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you begin your process of maturation, of of maturity, you are going to come to some things. All of us come to some things, regardless of whether, as I've already mentioned, whether you're first generation apostolic or you've been sitting on a pew for 13, 14, 15, 16, however long it is, and you finally, you finally connect the dots, you believe, you move forward, you respond, you obey, and now you have received. You are going to start, according to 1 Peter 2 and 2, as a newborn babe. This is exactly why the Bible said, born again. Well, if you, once you're born again in the kingdom, there is a process that almost mirrors the chronological process that takes place in the natural. We are newborn babes, then we are children, then we, we move through childhood and spiritual adolescence until we mature and become fully grown. Um, in maturity in the kingdom of God. But I'm just I'm just seeing a lot of things in the body that seem to make that growth process one that becomes instead of a steady flow and a forward movement, it becomes disjointed. It becomes um, almost scattered um it's not a flow it's like it's like people come to a place where this is just an observation as a pastor if you're wherever you go if you're watching this somewhere and your pastor teaches it teaches it and his observations are different you're you listen to your pastor i've been doing this for 30 years and i went through this experience myself But I have noticed that there are some aspects of this growth where people get hung up, that if they they don't get beyond getting hung up, 
it will leave them in a certain state of spiritual suspended animation. I'm seeing the exact same thing in our culture. Let me explain. With the advent of video games, with the advent of one of the things that sociologists, um, and I, I read these things where they are baffled that there is a segment of our culture where you have children that are prolonging their adolescence by living with their parents. 150 years ago in this nation, and even less than that in certain sectors of our nation, 80% of our culture at the turn of the previous century, 1899 to 1900, 80% of America lived in rural areas. And people that lived in those rural areas, their dream was not to, to move to the city and become cosmopolitan. Their dream was to grow up, get married, and have a farm, start a family, and, and that was their interpretation of their future. It was the interpretation of their, of their purpose. It came from agriculture, the very first culture of humanity was agriculture. And, and when people came to the United States, they, they got a piece of property and they cultivated that property and they did the best they could with that property. But it passed down to their children and, and to consecutive generations that this is going to be my occupation and I wanna get married. I wanna find the right, the right person for my life and I wanna have children start a family and, and da, 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 okay? We are, are, we are way far removed from that sociologically to where we are in a culture now that 80% of our culture is now living in cosmopolitan areas. It's completely flipped. And so the, the perception of a person's life, their, their processes of how they see themselves, their purpose, their identity, their purpose. What am I gonna do with my future? That's all changed. And part of, of what is baffling sociologists in their study of people living in a cosmopolitan, driven, influenced world is you're seeing people that are living with their parents older and older and older, where children used to be out on their own very early on. They got married as teenagers and they started families as in their late teens, mid and late teens. And, and they had to go out and, and get a job. They had to cultivate the land. They had to sacrifice. They had to be disciplined. They had to, they had to mature. All of those things, all of those struggles brought a much younger maturation, okay? When you, get, when you get married at 16 and you have your first child at 18, your, your maturity level is going to happen much quicker to the, to the young person that lives with their mom and dad until they're 30 or 35. And, and now they're just, now they've, they've already worked fast food. So they're now they're, they're going into that second wave of, of trying to find out what they're going to do with the rest of their life. And it may be, it may be in that third or fourth wave of, of employment before they finally get some direction. But now but now they're in their mid thirties. They're in their mid thirties, and they're they're just now deciding and determining what they want to do with the rest. Why is that? Their maturity has been put off because of a prolonged and protracted time that has been given to adolescence, where they may be chronologically moving on emotionally, mentally, and their maturity, maturity level is still over here. In, it's in adolescence. Adolescence is, 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 is the doorstep of adulthood. And, and you should, like, like part of a rocket that should fall away, you got here by going through that, but it should fall away and now, and now you're on your own. There is that hanging on. And this is baffling sociologists. 
Why do I think that this is important? Because I think it's in the church today. It's in the church today where you're having people, young people, and I'm not saying this critically, I'm saying this realistically, that the sooner that you accept the, the processes and the responsibility, resp responsibility is critical to coming to these things as it should come to you in your life. At the age of 12 years old, most boys already knew how to do anything that was on that farm. They, they knew how uh, to, to get the, the oxen ready. They knew how to milk the cows. They knew that this had to be done so this could be done. They knew the sequence. They knew the reason behind it. They could run those farms by the age of 12, 13, 14 years of age. Well, 12, 13, 14 in our culture, a kid is barely making it through grade school because he's spending so much time playing video games and, and caught up with other things. The culture is so, is so quick to dispense. Where are the parents? That's a whole nother deal. But this is all part and parcel of where we find ourselves. But this particular passage of scripture, to me, it dramatically and graphically reveals that once I mature, the Apostle Paul said that once I became, now I can make the appropriate choices to put away those things of my childhood. What can we do? Last night here at Cornerstone, I taught part two. There's going to be a part three and a part four because I get into this and it's just like there's more stuff to talk about. We're talking about a home that honors God, building a home, setting in motion a home because God is going to build the house. But I want to cooperate with God. So what can I do at my level to be where I need to be with God so that God can build the house. Pentecost cannot afford to lose the home. Once Pentecost loses our lifestyle, how we actually live, then we are only Pentecost at church. And ladies and gentlemen, we have lost the war. That is exactly where denominationalism is. And we cannot afford, this was never intended to be a denomination. This never will be a denomination. If we lose it, there's gonna be other people that haven't lost it, and they're the ones that are gonna carry this thing all the way through. What we need to do is understand if we have lost it, let's get it back. And that means that we have to comb through the weeds of our lifestyle and, and maybe, maybe take a, a closer examination of how we're living. So this particular passage of Scripture is important to me because it reveals that there is a level of maturity that is... I cannot make these choices as a child. When I'm a child, I'm going to think exactly how I'm supposed to think as a child. The Apostle Paul is, is saying that. But he's saying that once I mature, once I grow up, once I arrive, once I accept the maturity that is mine, now I can make the appropriate choices to this word that's being used here in the Greek is katario. It means to put away. It means to render useless. It means to deactivate. They, they, they're not important to me anymore. I can now put away these things because I am now in a far more superior place than I was down here. This is where God wants to bring all of us. If, if you're listening to me out there and you're saying, Pastor, I've done a lot of stupid things because I was thinking as a child, don't give up. Up. Philippians 1 and 6 is, he which hath begun a good work in you will see it all the way unto completion. 
Yes, there may be some very hard lessons. There may be some pain. There may be some scars. But you have to mature. You cannot, you cannot look at that block of development and say, that's me. That is not you. That was you developing. And you may have made some mistakes. You made, may have made some horrible choices. But that is not how God is viewing you. God is viewing you through the lens of maturity. And I want to tell you something. I think, I think sometimes that there are people that go through some things and make some mistakes that are critical to other people that are just now coming into this that need somebody that has come all the way through that can say, hey, don't do that. Because I, I've learned a few things. You don't even need to tell everybody where you drop the ball and the mistakes you've made. But make no mistake about it. That prodigal son, that prodigal son was invaluable. He was invaluable because his experience now could be used. Hey, you don't have to go out there. There's nothing there. Yes, I did that. And God, God's grace and God's love and God's mercy and the Father has re-equipped re -equipped me with the best robe and the ring of authority and shoes on my feet and, and celebration of my return. And I want to tell you, I've, I've done some stupid things. I'm not there anymore. That's not me. That was never who, who God saw all of me to be. That was a, a chapter in a great book. Paul, the King David said it this way. In Psalm 51, one of the most critical prayers of the entire word of God. After he was purged with hyssop, then will I teach transgressors and sinners will be converted unto thee. My horrible choices, my horrible experiences, being very immature, very self-centered, very self selfish, all of that. I learned something, and now I can teach sinners. Let us come to the place of putting away childish things. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Um, this is just something that God dropped into my spirit this morning, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless you.